أكبر الله أكبر أكبر In August of 1990, the ruthless dictator of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, invaded the small nation of Kuwait, unleashing a wave of human rights atrocities against the Kuwaiti people. In the early morning hours of August 2nd, Iraqi armed forces, without provocation or warning, invaded a peaceful Kuwait. Facing negligible resistance from its much smaller neighbor, Iraq's tanks stormed in blitzkrieg fashion through Kuwait in a few short hours. On August 2nd, 1990, the Iraqi army of more than one million standing invaded Kuwait, who had a very small force of 16,000 troops. From this day on, the U.S. began to take steps to protect its interests and our allies and stop the atrocities being committed by the Iraqi army. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. I took this action to assist the Saudi Arabian government in the defense of its homeland. No one commits America's armed forces to a dangerous mission lightly, but after perhaps unparalleled international consultation and exhausting every alternative, it became necessary to take this action. I was an E-5 at the time. I was a scout uh, section sergeant. We got called in, I think it was around 4.30 in the morning, and it was the first alert. And we were told to prepare for combat operations in Southwest Asia. And the 82nd Airborne had left. They were on their way to Saudi Arabia, and they knew that they were gonna need mechanized, mechanized infantry, mechanized as in our M1 Abrams because we were looking at the fourth largest army in the world with Iraq. And with us, we were taught and trained uh, that the Iraq army was not only the fourth largest army in the world at the time, but they also had eight years of combat experience fighting against the Iranians. August of 1990, I went to my regular drill and they said, you know all that stuff going on in Kuwait, I, don't, I wonder if we're going to get called up. And it's like, oh yeah, and reserves don't get called up. They haven't been called up since Vietnam. That won't happen. So, you know, we kind of joked it off in our August training. And then come September, we get the call that said, Raging Bull. And for us, that meant you have to report to your unit within 24 hours of receiving that phone call. So that was how we got activated and got pulled into Desert Storm. It wasn't right that Saddam invaded Kuwait and we kind of dismissed it, I think, until all of a sudden we got that phone call and then it was like, oh shoot, this is happening. We only have a week to get our affairs in order and all of a sudden we go from being a reservist to being full time and we're not going to see our families again, our jobs, you know, everything. We had to get wills in order. And I was assigned to a small team at that time. Uh, we were uh, unidentifiable uniformed soldiers. Basically, we all wore the same outfit, no names, no, no tape, no ranks, anything like that. We all had call signs. I had to sign three documents uh, before I could join the team in February 1990. First one was I would never be promoted past the rank of staff sergeant. I was just a young buck sergeant. I'd been in for 20 months so far. After that, I had to sign a document that said if I was ever to be taken, captured, or soon to be captured, it would be okay for my men to take me out. And the third one was I'd be willing to take out a team member. I signed all three documents. 
and I was introduced to my team. We trained from then until the time I left Turkey, which was January or July 31st, uh, three days before the invasion. Again, we already knew something was going to happen. Uh, we knew it was going to happen soon. Within 12 hours of the Iraqi assault, the Kuwaiti royal family had fled to Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait had fallen into the clutches of Saddam Hussein. And then when we found out that we actually were going over to Saudi Arabia, they told the news in a Tampa Bay area before they told us. So our families were calling us to tell us, and they were misinforming us so that we wouldn't tell the enemy when we were leaving or something like that. And it was ridiculous the way that it went around that we finally found out, they told the news that we were leaving like Thursday at seven and we left Thursday at seven. But what they told us was Tuesday at two and Friday at noon and we were going and we weren't going. So it was kind of a strange, really two months there that one minute we're a reservist and two months later we're boots on the ground in the sand. Living in the desert was hard, learning, um, you know, how to keep your water cold. We didn't have a shower, you know, you know, a hot shower point or anything like that. You didn't have telephones, you know, where you were very dependent on letters. Those were the longest and probably the worst days of my life. I'll, I'll be honest with you. We did basically the law enforcement stuff when we did convoy escorts. That was when we started getting in some of the heavier equipment and we started uh, escorting it to different locations and that. Camels run out in front of the road like you'd have deer here in West Virginia. There you would have wild camels just run across the road in the middle of nowhere. It was, it was really crazy. That was how probably the first uh, couple weeks, maybe a month, Went. As several peace resolutions were proposed, Saddam tried to connect his invasion of Kuwait to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in an attempt to bring in potential Arab allies to his cause. His deception was ill-received and the majority of Arab nations united against Iraq. Worst development may yet come. This is because we are Arabs. And since we are genuine in our humanity, we rejected, as we still do, the Zionist encroachment upon the land of Palestine, their oppressive practices against the Palestinians, and their occupation of the Holy Land. In November of 1990, the final United Nations peace resolution demanded the withdrawal of Iraqi forces from Kuwait by January 15, 1991. Hussein again refused to comply and ordered his troops to dig in and prepare to fight to the end. Everybody was already en route to Saudi Arabia. I was just chilling, uh, basically going through school, got assigned to Fort Bragg, took some TDY leave, you know, just, just kind of hanging out. I didn't go to uh, Saudi Arabia until late November. We were attached to the MI Brigade. Uh, for accountability purposes, and that's where we reported to, 18th Airborne Corps. The United Nations had uh, given the okay to use any means available to uh, extract Iraq out of Kuwait. During the military buildup in Operation Desert Shield, the U.S. amassed two naval battle groups, 500,000 troops, over 125 fighters and bombers, with a huge number of armor and other assets, not including over half a million coalition troops from 34 nations. Under the outstanding leadership of General Storman Norman Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell, the coalition reached 100% readiness to forcefully remove Iraqi forces from Kuwait if they didn't comply with the January 15th deadline. When the sandstorms come in, you know, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. So we were living in our vehicles. We had stretched camouflage netting over our vehicles. Uh, we finally got some cots, uh, probably right about Thanksgiving. And, uh, but we lived and slept on the vehicles, slept on the ground, slept in a fighting position, you know, from the time we got there until we went to war. We would have the alarms go off and everybody would pull out their masks and put them on 
and then people would start crying and writing their letters to their family and that and I got to the point where we only had one set of filters which was good for two hours so you would last if you got hit for two hours the threat of Iraq using chemical weapons increased daily as Hussein had previously used them not only against Iran but his own people coalition forces constantly donned their chemical protective gear in anticipation of a chemical attack. And that was kind of when I think it clicked for me that this wasn't a game and that things were just gonna get worse from here on out. That was a hard time. That was a hard time. It toughened you up. It made you wanna fight when the time came, that was for sure. Up around, right around Christmas time, uh, that we started to see, you know, people started to show signs of, um, you yeah, know, they get a little delirious. You know, I had a few soldiers, they get a little delirious. They're um, missing home. On January 16th, after Iraq failed to meet the UN deadline to withdraw, Desert Shield ended and Desert Storm began, and coalition forces rained down 88,500 tons of bombs on the Iraqi infrastructure and military, whose air force failed miserably and gave the coalition air superiority, enabling our ground forces to start the liberation of Kuwait. January 16th, the air war kicked off. We, I was actually Sergeant of the Guard that night, and it was at roughly two o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had a phone that was hooked up to the main talk, and that thing never rang. Never rang, man. But it rang that night, and rang, and and they said, you answer that, that call, that's the call. Answer the phone call. And it said, uh, alert, alert, alert. Operation Desert Shield is now Operation Desert Storm. Uh, and then they gave us, relayed the information to relay to the troops, uh, we are at war. And uh, prepare your troops to move. Over the next five weeks of coalition air raids, Iraqi Scud missiles became their primary target. As Iraq launched Scud missiles at civilians in Israel, Saudi Arabia, and other Middle Eastern nations, our special operations and air forces hunted down Saddam's Scud forces in every corner of Iraq. Funny thing was, in 2011, uh, they declassified information regarding teams being inside of Iraq prior to the air war. I was one of those lucky souls. <laughs> uh, how else do you think that all those cruise missiles could land on their exact targets. There was a large berm that separated Iraq and Saudi Arabia. So we go to the berm and we set up right there. The first night we were there, there was uh, just a tremendous amount of movement in the air and uh, explosions and tracer fire. I mean, you knew as soon as um, the uh, aircraft crossed the Iraqi border, they would start shooting up flares. And I remember calling in, I, it must have been 100 flares that I have to call in. You know, you have to call in everything. As coalition forces continued their air campaign, Iraqi forces responded by attacking Saudi Arabia, consequently being defeated by coalition forces. This attack prompted the coalition ground offensive. What we started to do was to run up what was uh, called Highway Ohio, and we would sit along different routes along it during the war, and 82nd and all the tanks and everybody would go up. We could hear the explosions and stuff, but we were lucky enough to be about 10 miles back from anything that was really going on. So we sat there, and then throughout the war, we would uh, still do convoy escorts. We would do area security on that road to make sure the road wasn't taken out or that Iraqis weren't coming in that way. We had one mission, one mission only. And the initial assessment uh, from the CIA was uh, casualties in the tens of thousands. Uh, that was killed in action. They outmanned us. There was, they were a million strong. Uh, they out-tanked us. They had over 200,000 armored vehicles. And to go to war with them was almost committing genocide. That's why our uh, 
rules of engagement were any means possible. You don't hear that anymore. Uh, and, you know, we were highly successful in our mission. Like I said, there was 148 combat deaths. And for a long time, I felt guilty about that. Our mission as a, as a scout was to, uh, to go forward, to scout out the enemy, plot targets, uh, call for fire. There was a small border position, border post, uh, that uh, they actually had a flag, and uh, they had a CSU-57-2, which is an aircraft, an aircraft gun, the two, the two barrel. And so every time they'd fire that gun, you know, at night, sometimes those shells would come down behind you. Boom, 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 boom. You know, what goes up has to come down. And uh, so that was kind of interesting, uh, seeing all that. We started crossing into Iraq probably January the 20th. January 26th is very, very vivid in my memory because that was my birthday. That was my birthday, January 26th, 1991. They came down, they said, happy birthday. I said, you guys are gonna go patrol that Iraqi border post. We haven't seen no movement over there in uh, a few days. So we want you to scout out, you know, that border. Uh, and it was just a building uh, where that ZSU 57-2 was at. A group of Ford observers were with us and we crossed in and they painted the target. And basically it was a laser guided round that went into that building and blew it up. And once that building blew up, you knew that nobody, if there was anybody in there, they were dead, that was for sure. But it was our job to go forward and do a BDA and assess that on January the 26th. Uh, was the first time that I saw uh, a dead enemy soldier that was obliterated uh, beyond all recognition. What I remember very distinctly was looking through my nods, my night vision device, uh, at that building and seeing a small red ember, you know, which is tremendously magnified by that night vision device. And I said, I think somebody's smoking a cigarette. And so we set up and uh, they told us to go forward, clear the area. So we go in uh, like we're doing a, uh, a hasty raid on that position. And when we get in there, it was a lit cigarette that one of those guys had been smoking when that round obliterated him. He was gone, but the cigarette was still there. And how amazing was that to see something like that? Uh, for me, that, that, was, that was very vivid in my mind as far as um, a memory that you never shake. Uh, but I had many more that came after that. And uh, uh, because at that point, we never, we never backed down. We were in Iraq. The United States and our allies outmaneuvered the Iraqi forces in lieu of direct engagement. This was possible because of our technological advantages, such as the newly developed Global Positioning System satellites better known as GPS, which provided our force with real-time navigational data, as well as intelligence on Iraqi military positions and movements. Believe it or not, GPS was brand new at the time. And uh, we would go in and if it took us burying ourselves to observe a target for two to three days, that's exactly what we did. Uh, we'd go in at night, we jumped in from 15,000 feet, and uh, we would jump in, hump, and uh, find our objective. And at night, we would bury ourselves. And by the time the, the day hit, you couldn't see us from uh, 500 meters out, but uh, we would gather intel and send it back to 18th Airborne Gore headquarters. As the Iraqis fled Kuwait in retreat after mere days of fighting, coalition forces seized the opportunity to seriously degrade the Iraqi armored divisions. In what became known as the Highway of Death, 
the Iraqi army lost 10,000 personnel and over 2,500 vehicles as they fled back to Baghdad. This not only hardened the might of coalition forces, but it is credited for breaking the back of the Iraqi war machine. The graphic images of the highway of death became iconic in representing the overwhelming defeat of Hussein's tyrannical invasion. It was really quick. And then we got the order to get up on the road and to move back towards Kuwait. And that's when we hit the highway of death and drove for miles and absolutely no place didn't have carnage, didn't have a dead body, didn't have a dog eaten on human bodies. Um, we were given a mission. They said, anytime you see them dogs, don't just shoot them. Shoot the dog. And I'm gonna say, I usually don't say any cuss words, but I'm gonna tell you what my first sergeant said because we had a young man that said, I can shoot people, but I don't want to shoot a dog. That dog didn't do nothing to me. And the first time I looked at him, he says, you shoot the damn dog, private. You shoot the damn dog, you hear me? And he shot the damn dog. And it was, um, I watched him in a firefight and it never affected him. I watched him shoot a dog and he cries. A dog that's eaten another human being. Um, it was, it was pretty crazy. And seeing all that and seeing people burned and charred beyond all recognition as a human being, um, you become cold. You become cold. You have to turn your feelings off. Um, guys would go by and put a cigarette in a dead guy's mouth and, you know, and try to laugh about it or but deep down inside, they weren't laughing. They were just trying to find some kind of normalcy in what was really an insanity. As the war was coming to an end, defeated Iraqis lost the will to fight. Consequently, over 300,000 Iraqi personnel either surrendered or deserted, including a full division that surrendered to an unarmed camera crew. I was on uh, EPW duty with the prisoners and helicopter had landed and the prisoners got out and I was a 60 gunner that was guarding right by the helicopter pad and I waved them on and they flew off and went about five miles down the road and didn't see some power lines and caught into it and crashed and I was like the last person to see them alive so that was upsetting. On February 27, 1991, coalition forces liberated Kuwait. In retreat, Iraqi forces lit fire to over 700 oil wells in a cowardice scorched earth campaign. In all, it took barely two months of fighting to bring the fourth largest army in the world to its knees. This showed the world that no nation could stand in battle against U.S. forces. Kuwait is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. Kuwait is once more in the hands of Kuwaitis in control of their own destiny. We share in their joy, a joy tempered only by our compassion for their ordeal. Tonight, the Kuwaiti flag once again flies above the capital of a free and sovereign nation. But we saw some Iraqis that were trying to flee Iraq and they couldn't go anywhere. And they were talking about being forced to fight um, you get shot if you, you know, didn't do what Saddam wanted. They wanted to go to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia wouldn't let them in. Kuwait wouldn't let them in. They're staying in this half building, starving. It was a family of about 10 or 12 people, and they were really nice. And they, they wanted us to finish it. They said, please take Saddam out. And that was, you know, kind of our thoughts that, we don't want to be there. We don't want to stop being reservists and go to war. But hey, we're already here. Why don't we just, you know, do what is needed done? Let's do what's right. As the CIA tried to encourage a citizen uprising in Iraq, the decision was made to leave a working government in place to keep stability in the region. Thus, Saddam remained in power following the war.
It had been easy to take Baghdad. It had been super easy. Why we didn't take out Saddam when we had the chance, I think it would have been a more popular thing to do then. I think that if we hadn't waited for, you know, uh, 14, 13, 14 years to go back over there and to take him out, um, I think that it would have been a little more well received by the public. Uh, but our leadership was pretty much set in the fact that, you know, we'd have made an agreement with our coalition. And the coalition obviously had to agree that as long as this isn't a spiteful attack on the Arab people uh, of Iraq, you know, we will support you. And you gotta remember, we had Syrians, we had Kuwaitis, we had uh, French, we had British, we had you know, we had Australians, we had people from all over, we had heck, heck of a coalition, Canadians, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but I, uh, there was a lot of nations that were there. So why we didn't take them out, he didn't take them out, we didn't take him out, is, um, is because that was not our mission at the time. So I can live with that. After almost eight months in the Persian Gulf and liberating the grateful nation of Kuwait, on March 10th, 1991, the main battle forces of the coalition began to withdraw from the Middle East and head for home. When we got back, we had a little parade at Fort Stewart and our families came up and that was wonderful. And I, I feel like, you know, I don't wanna say bad things about it. We got, you know, a lot more thanks. We didn't get spit on like the Vietnam veterans and I feel really bad about them. We had all these health problems. And again, that was due to, I think, all the shots we had, all those Scud missiles. They, you know, one minute they're saying, Saddam's giving his people chemicals. He's giving, you know, shooting chemicals at you. The Scuds are full of chemicals, chemicals, chemicals. We had a chemical alarms go off. And then we get back and we say, we have health problems. And they go, there was never any chemical weapons in the entire war. We don't know what you're talking about. Yes, we had a lot better response when we came back than other wars, but there's still a lot missing. And the whole time, you know, I was leading a secret life away from my family and my wife. They had no idea I was in combat until I had my flashback in 2011. I cracked wide open. I'd had psychological hardening to uh, be able to endure our mission. I told my wife that our life had been scripted by the United States Army. They, uh, they always made sure she knew where the units were, when they were gone, all that stuff. And it was all, it was all lies. And the hardest thing that I ever heard in my life was uh, her telling me that after being married to a man for 21 years, and I don't even know him, it was tough. My dad was a Vietnam veteran, and I remember calling him, and uh, this is probably the most emotional you'll see me get, but I remember saying, Dad, I'm home. And he said, that's good, son. He said, I've been watching the news. And he just started to cry. He said, uh, he said we ain't gonna let you boys get the welcome home like we got. And, and my dad was there. In, not much in my life as a child, but he was there for me when I was a veteran, whenever I come home. And, and a lot of other Vietnam veterans were there and we can't thank them enough because they said, you're not gonna treat these boys like you treated us. And they made sure they were out there in full force. And I could look out and I could see 10,000 people. And literally, you see that kind of people in places that you'd fly into, like the New York airport when we were flying home and people clapping their hands and, and, but you could always look and you could see that guy with that vest on that said, Vietnam veteran, walking up to you. And I remember one guy I'd never met before in my life, I'll never see him again, reaching out of the crowd, grabs me, pulls me to him and hugs him and he says, Welcome home. I mean, gave me the biggest hug and said, welcome home. Good job, well done. And I looked at him and I said, thank you for what you did for us then and now. 
it was amazing. Uh, we landed in Bangor, Maine. Uh, I think every plane landed in Bangor. And uh, there was uh, just thousands of people lined up to want to shake your hand, handing you beer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was 2, 2 a.m. in the morning. They were there around the clock uh, greeting planes as they come in. U.S. forces returned home to a grateful nation. Celebrations erupted across the states, and pride in our heroes touched the hearts of Americans everywhere.